All right. Good morning, everybody. So today you have a double-barreled lecture, so I'll uh, be talking about this stuff for the first half, hopefully, of the lecture. Um, and then Dr. McCarty will be talking in the second half. All right. So biological therapies for respiratory diseases. So what is a biological therapy? Well, different people have different views, so I'm going to define what I mean by biological therapy. So it's a non-small molecule drug, basically. It can be derived from a living source, like a protein or an antibody or something like that, or it may merely be inspired by that, so it might have been synthetically modified. Um, but non-small molecule drug. So typically they are proteins, um, there's also some nucleotides, other sorts of um, biological macromolecules. Recently people have been working pretty hard at developing alternative protein scaffolds, so things like anticalins or um, other things like that, so that you can avoid some of the issues of antibodies that I will talk about soon. So in Australia it's kind of confusing because um, scientists or medicos will talk about biologicals as being antibodies used as therapies. The Therapeutic Goods Administration uses a different kind of definition of the word biologicals. So this is their um, scheme for how they regulate all medicines. And you've got your typical sort of drugs over here on the left hand side and antibodies also fall in this class. So if they work through immunological means, they're considered medicines. If they're being used as a therapeutic sort of agent, then it's considered a medicine rather than, like what Rosa will talk about later, um, stem cell therapy or something coming out of an actual organism, a tissue itself. That's what they call a biological. That's not what we're calling a biological. And they also, in the middle, regulate medical devices. All right. so. How do therapeutic antibodies work? Well, they can work through a whole host of different mechanisms. There's four listed here. There are other ways that they can work as well. So your typical sort of mechanisms will be a, a simple receptor blockade. So you'll use the antibody um, to block the receptor that you want to interfere with. You can also target your antibody against the ligand itself. So there's an example over here. So if you have an antibody binding to the ligand, then the ligand can't interact with the receptor. So that's um, a different sort of mechanism. Antibodies do all sorts of other things. So you can also use antibodies to change signaling within a cell. You can induce signaling, you can um, decrease signaling, you can cause the receptor that it binds to to actually be internalized into the cell. So there's all sorts of different mechanisms. Most uh, therapeutic antibodies work through these top two, either binding to a ligand, um, a cytokine, for example, or a chemokine, or binding to its cognate receptor. So why do we use biologicals? Well, antibodies have really, really, really high specificity. So way higher than a typical small molecule drug. So the way small molecule drugs work is they have a certain shape. They'll bind into an active site of, for example, a kinase. And lots of other kinases have a similar active site, so there'll be lots of off-target effects, typically, of small molecule drugs. It's hoped that with greater specificity, you'll have decreased off-target effects, decreased adverse effects, aka side effects. Antibodies and proteins, they're much bigger than small molecules. So they can interfere with big structures coming together. They can get in the way, in a way that small molecules um, typically can't. So they can target different sorts of interactions. Because they're all based on a similar backbone and there's been lots of antibodies have gone through clinical trials, lots of proteins have gone through um, clinical trials before, regulators go, well we are pretty confident in how this thing is going to work. We're pretty confident that we know its specificity, um, we know a lot about the target that it's going for and so there's a greater chance that your um, antibody will get regulator approval. One of the biggest hurdles in using biologicals was that it was really hard to generate large amounts of them. These uh, production methods have now been refined, so they're pretty easy to generate in really large quantities, 
so that's no longer a hurdle. Why would you not use them? Well, small molecules, most drugs, will be taken orally. People like to just have a pill that they can then take for whatever they need to take it for. So antibodies typically um, will get degraded if they're taken orally. So what we call their pharmacokinetics, or how they move around the body, is not optimal. They don't cross cell membranes, so you need to either target something that's out in the extracellular space or target a um, cell surface expressing protein. One of the kind of advantages is that now you can um, give an antibody and it might last for a really long time in the body. So they may not be orally bioavailable, but you might only need to give the antibody once a month, once every two months, something like that. So that is actually an advantage. They're really expensive. So it takes quite a lot of um, effort to produce antibodies, and so they can typically be thousands of dollars compared to, to produce compared to you know, cents for some small molecules where the synthetic chemistry is really well defined. And then we also have some problems of immunogenicity. So when you're using an antibody as a therapy, you don't want to have all different antibodies that you're injecting into your patient. You want to have a single antibody, a single clone. So how do we generate single clones of antibodies? Well, we generate monoclonal antibodies. So they're typically produced um, from mice. They're fused with a tumor cell to form a hybridoma to end up with a monoclonal antibody. But that's a mouse antibody. So if you put a mouse antibody into a human, the human's going to go, oh, hang on, I've got a bit of mouse in me, and it will generate, the human will generate an immune response against the mouse antibody. So back when this was the technology, you couldn't use them as therapeutics. So people had to figure out how to humanize antibodies. So through um, cloning strategies and through the gen generation of now fully humanized mice, so mice that generate fully human antibodies, you can now get fully human antibodies. So some of the therapeutic antibodies are humanized, so they're mostly um, human antibodies with just the murine complementary determining region, or CDR, or you can have a fully human antibody. And they've got different um, suffixes on the end of them. So you can tell the derivation of the antibody or how human it is based on its um, suffix at the end. So biologicals for respiratory disease. So I was talking about asthma the other day. This has been um, highly targeted with uh, therapeutic antibodies. So what you've got in asthma are lots of chemokines and cytokines that are mediating the signaling. So it's a type two response. So the, the key um, mediators of this response are IL-4, IL-13, IL-5. So those are the typical type 2 sort of cytokines, and these are the ones that people have spent a lot of time, or companies have spent a lot of time trying to target as therapeutics. The first um, one that was targeted is IgE, so I'll talk about that soon. So that is the typical um, asthmatic antibody. So these are all the different... Uh, antibodies that have been produced by different companies. Some of them have their old um, like company name. So if they still have their old company name, it means they didn't make it all the way into the clinic. Um, the ones with the you know, newer sort of names. Some of them have now been approved, which is great, um, and some of them are still in clinical trials, and some of them went through clinical trials and then failed because they didn't show enough efficacy. So you'll see that the same uh, therapeutics appear several times in this pathway because these cytokines, IL-4, IL-13, IL-5, mediate lots of different aspects. So they appear several times wherever the, the cytokine's doing its thing. All right, so anti-IgE. So this was the very first um, antibody that was approved for asthma. The therapeutic is called omeluzumab. And what does it do? Well, it binds to IgE. So this is um, a ligand targeting agent. It does two things. So it stops the IgE um, from 
interacting on mast cells. It also decreases the level of the high affinity receptor for IgE, so it has two mechanisms of action. By doing these two things, it decreases the amount of mediators released, it decreases um, mast cell degranulation, decreases the allergic inflammation, decreases smooth muscle shortening. So it's really expensive. It's only used when people have, um, you know, when they're indicated for this. So they have to have moderate to severe asthma and they have to have elevated IgE. So some asthmatics will not have elevated IgE. This therapy would not work. Most people respond very well to steroids and to bronchodilator agents like salbutamol. So they're really, really cheap drugs. If someone responds really well to that, they're not going to be given omalizumab because it's really, really expensive. So it's prescribed, I think the latest numbers were about 0.0001% of the Australian population are on this. So that came out um, over a decade ago and is used in a very small proportion of people. And then this was extremely exciting um, last year and the year before because this was the first new therapy for asthma in 12 years. So this is um, anti-IL-5 antibodies. So these two drugs target the IL-5 itself, so ligand targeting. There's also another agent that targets the receptor for IL-5. And they're produced by different companies, which is why they have different names. But essentially, they do the same thing. So they interfere with IL-5 binding to its receptor. And what's interesting about these drugs is that when they were first um, tried in clinical trials, the people who ran the clinical trial didn't select the right patients. So they ran through, so this had its old, its old name. Good sign it failed. Um, but even mepolutzumab, one of the ones that's now approved, was used in a mild to moderate allergic asthma and they didn't see any effect on um, clinical asthma improvement at the end of the study. So lots of um, antibodies or drugs that go through a clinical trial like that would then get scrapped and millions of dollars would go to waste. But someone went, oh, hang on a second, let's try again. Let's throw some more money at this. Um, let's trial it in the right patients. And you can see they were much stricter in the, the patients that they included in the next study. So they had to have severe asthma. They had to have type 2 inflammation. So IL-5 is a type 2 sort of um, cytokine. So there's no point if they've got um, a neutrophilic sort of inflammation in their asthma. So high blood eosinophils, another sign that it's type 2. This drug here is the one I was talking about that targets the IL-5 receptor alpha. It's not yet approved, but it's also showing um, quite good efficacy. So this points to the fact that clinical trials, you need the right patient group, or even for therapy, you need the right patient or they're not going to respond. So the last um, one that I'm going to talk about for asthma is the anti-IL-4 receptor antibody. So it's called dupilumab. And this is a really um, interesting sort of therapy because by targeting the IL-4 receptor, it actually ablates IL-4 and IL-13 signaling. And the reason it does this is that the IL-4 receptors over here and the IL-13 receptors here, and they share this IL-4 receptor alpha subunit in their receptor. So they've got a different other subunit that determines the specificity, whether it's going to bind to IL-4 or IL-13. The IL-13 um, cytokine can also bind to this other, what's called a decoy receptor. So this therapy won't bind to this receptor over here, but it's not thought that this receptor actually mediates any signaling of the IL-13. So it doesn't matter that it's not targeting over here. So it's targeting the um, both IL-4 and IL-13 signaling pathways. By interfering with it binding to the receptor, stops signaling and stops um, all the things that IL-4 and IL-13 do in, within the cell. So dupilumab, it went through a phase 2A study back in 2013, and the results were really quite staggering. So you've got here your placebo group, 
that has a steady increase in exacerbation, so the number of asthma attacks. So in a typical um, asthma study, people are left on their, um, their, their background therapy, so typically steroids and um, bronchodilator agents. You can see the bronchodilator was then withdrawn and they start to have exacerbations and the dupilumab group was protected from that. They then tapered away the steroid and again dupilumab was really protective from the increase in exacerbations. At the end here, you've got patients who are just on either dupilumab or the placebo treatment and there's really quite a difference there. And then you've got your um, lung function tests on the right. So FEV1 as a percent predicted and FEV1 in total litres. And again, you see a lot more lung function in the people who are treated with dupilumab. So that looked really nice. It then went on to phase 2B studies. This was published late last year. Um, it's now in phase 3 studies, so it can't be approved till it's gone through um, the full phase 3 studies. This was a dose finding study and to my eye anyway, all the doses look pretty much the same, but they're all better than placebo. So there's lots of new promising therapies for asthma of the type 1 variety. TH2, typical asthma. So most of these people respond very well to steroids. There are some people that don't, um, so that's why these therapies are being produced. There's lots of work to develop um, therapies for non-TH2, which has been summarised over here because pretty much none of them work. So 10F-alpha was tried. This is the old EMAB. Um, so this is a non-fully humanised antibody. But anyway, none of them have worked so far. COPD, it's basically the same story. So there's lots of things um, that have been tried for COPD. There's um, highly intricate signalling cascades. And summarised here, nothing works. So what are we going to do as scientists? Well, this was the story 10 years ago where you had some sort of genetic mutation or something going wrong leads to a protein dysregulation. We had to drug the protein dysregulation. So you had to design either a biological or a small molecule to target what's going wrong with the protein. We couldn't do anything about the genetic mutation itself. Well, that's all changed recently. So we've now got lots of um, work going into gene editing. So why would we use gene editing? Well, you can only use gene editing when you know what has gone wrong with the gene. So when you think about respiratory diseases, we don't know what causes asthma. We don't know the genetic mutations really. So that wouldn't be a very good um, target disease for gene editing. COPD, it's environmentally induced. So to prevent people getting COPD, they need to not be exposed to noxious particles. So that's also not the best disease for gene editing. Um, what's known about lung cancer, that could be quite useful. The typical respiratory disease for gene editing is cystic fibrosis because there's very well described genetic mutations. So the CFTR gene is the gene that is responsible for um, cystic fibrosis. There can be all sorts of mutations that result in this um, uh, transporter not being present on the epithelium in the airways. So why do we need this chloride channel on our airways? Well, it's involved in mucus transport. And if you don't have appropriate um, iron transfer and fluid transfer, then you're not going to have nice slippery airways that you can then have mucociliary clearance and get things out of your airways. So cystic fibrosis doesn't just affect the airways, it affects anywhere where you need this um, transporter, but it is obviously highly important in the airways. So how are we going to edit this gene? Well, we've identified what the mutation is. So there's different sorts of ways that we can edit genes. The one that is kind of the hit one at the moment is CRISPR-Cas9. There's also um, zinc finger and talons, but they are not important for right now. So how does it work? Well, Cas9 is a bacterial enzyme, and it's guided to the genome 
by, the, by a single guide RNA. So a short sequence of RNA will then bind into the DNA and the Cas9 comes in and it chops the DNA. Once it's chopped the DNA, it can then cause either an indel mutation that stops that gene being transcribed. So that wouldn't be very useful for cystic fibrosis where we want the gene. But it might be useful for another disease where you have a protein that's being expressed where it shouldn't be. So that's how you stop a gene um, from working. And then you can also add in the correct DNA sequence. So it's called homology directed repair. So what you do is you put in your guide, you put in your Cas9 enzyme, and you put in another sequence of DNA. And that gets directed to that bit in the DNA that is wrong, it's got the wrong code, the wrong mutation, and it fixes up the sequence. So it's a really amazing new um, technology that some people um, say they've tried in humans, but it's not yet proven. You can do all sorts of other things with this new technology. You might be able to rearrange chromosomes. You can chop out huge bits of DNA. And you can even actually cause transcriptional changes. So rather than chopping the DNA, you can recruit other cofactors to that site in the DNA. And you can rewind up the chromatin or whatever. So the biggest issue is how to get those gene editing things into the airways. So if you have some embryo, you could inject it into the, the embryo using a tiny little syringe needle. Another approach is that you can do it ex vivo. So if you're trying to modify immune cells, it's quite good because you can actually take immune cells out of a person by bleeding them. You could modify those cells ex vivo and then you can stick them back in again. So if the immune cells, if you modify the immune cells in the blood system, you might be able to get them back into the airways and hopefully fix up airway disease. The other way is to do it in situ or to deliver some viral particles or some nanoparticles or something directly into the airways to then recode those cells that are within the airways, whether they be immune cells or epithelial cells. So this is all theoretical, none of this has been done yet, but it's certainly looking like the way that um, therapy is going to go in the future. So that's it from me. Rosa. I think we'll avoid the mood lighting. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. Um, I'm going to talk to you now uh, for the next half of this lecture, really pulling together the respiratory block and the stem cell block um, by talking about stem cells and how they are being used or approaches that are being made to look at how stem cells might be possible for uh, as a therapeutic agent. So. I've got learning objectives for you as well, so I hope that you'll understand a little bit about respiratory stem cells at the end of this 25 minutes. But I'm really hoping you might recognise the complexity of being able to use stem cells in this setting because of the complexity of lung and the diversity of different diseases affecting the lung as well. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of approaches that are in clinical trials at the moment um, for using stem cells. Uh, mesenchymal stromal cells uh, for uh, COPD and potentially asthma. So in 2012 this article was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and it stimulated a lot of interest. It was very exciting. There was a 33 year old woman. She had um, lung cancer and she had what's called a pneumonectomy. So she had a, a region of her lung removed to remove those tumours. So not what normally happens when following removal removal of the lung is that you have a decrease in your vital capacity because there's less lung there. And that usually degrades over time with age, but it doesn't, it doesn't improve. 
So you've removed the cancer, but the lung doesn't repair itself. What they found with this woman was that her uh, vital capacity actually started to increase over time. And they found that it was actually that her lung was actually starting to regenerate and repair. And before that, it was considered that the lung was basically, it didn't really have a very high turnover. When they looked at the turnover rates in lung, it was very, very slow, very poor turnover. We know that alveolar cells, for example, uh, in the lung have a, live for about 17 months, so that explains that low turnover. But this was really the first communicated uh, example of a human being able to regrow parts of their lung, and that stimulated a lot of interest in this field. So when I started working in lung stem cell research, um, it was a very new field. It was exciting. Um, mesenchymal stromal cells were the big hit we were moving into. You know, there weren't iPS cells yet. And people were really interested in identifying what stem cells there were in the lung. And so this has really taken off and the sophistication of techniques that have been used in this time have started to provide much clearer a much clearer idea of stem cells that are involved in homeostasis in the lung but also in response to injury. Most of what we know, we know from using animal models. So one of the real um, uh, limitations to being able to understand how stem cell regulation works in the human lung is the availability of tissue samples. You can imagine people aren't so tend to be willing to give up their lung for research if they're still needing it. So the only lung tissue that we tend to get is from um, individuals who have cancer or some sort of pathophysiology. They may have passed away from a severe pathophysiology associated in the lung. Or it might be a small resected region because of tumours. And very rarely do we get normal human lung tissue. So that's been quite difficult to be able to progress our understanding of what's going on in the, in the human lung. We also know that there are regional differences as well. So when you get a small section of lung, it may not have much airway in it, maybe may, just mainly um, mesenchymal tissue, and so that's sort of held back the field. So most of these, the research has been done uh, using mice and using a range of different techniques. And what I want, really want to emphasise here is what we know is not based on a single... Um, assay. It's not based on a single uh, in vivo assay or in vitro assay. It's a combination of real sophistication in cross-checking the studies that we do. So how does it behave in the dish? How does it behave in the animal? How can we knock in, knock out, um, using mouse models to be able to understand what's going on? So what we know is from ontogenies. So ontogeny is from development. We know that um, repair recapitulates ontogeny. So the same processes that are involved in development are used again during repair mechanisms. So by having a look at how lung development occurs, we can actually understand what key cells are involved in this developmental process of branching morphogenesis, which is the branching of the airways um, to the alveolar units. Um, and so we have a look at the cells that are involved, the signalling molecules that are involved, and those interactions. And we know that there is very important interaction between epithelial progenitor cells and mesenchymal progenitor cells. So at, this is a limb bud, uh, sorry, this is a um, airway bud, and you've got these uh, epithelial progenitor cells which are growing out, and they respond to cues, uh, in this instance, FGF10, which is a really essential regulator of epithelial development. And these cells, these progenitor populations, in, via their mutual interaction and release of um, uh, signalling molecules, actually at the same time proliferate and differentiate. So as these cells start to mature, the mesenchymal progenitor cells mature to smooth muscle cells, and you also have your epithelial cells starting to differentiate into more mature, committed epithelial cell types, of which there are many. There have been some wonderful studies using lineage tracing. So this is using knock-in or knock-out models to be able to um, get when a gene is turned on and identifying a gene that's important in lung development, it produces, in this instance, um, a colour, so it's got a tag on it, so when that gene is expressed, it produces 
here's this coloration that you can see. So what happens is that you can actually trace, and this is an example of ID2, which is an essential um, gene involved in uh, epithelial development uh, in the lung. And you can actually see that during mouse development, these progenitor cells actually give rise to virtually all of the epithelial cells within this more mature lung tissue. So then we can start to understand that that is an important gene. And so we start to uh, extrapolate that to what we know in the adult. So it's really this combination of um, having a look at developmental studies, but combining them with transplantation assays, looking at phenotype by using techniques such as flow cytometry, and coupling that with um, in vitro assays that show functional potential. So that might be using organoids or using um, clonogenic assays to be able to infer the potential of cells that you're isolating, which then have to demonstrate their function not only in a dish, but also when you put them into a biological system as well. The last important uh, contributing study or contributing studies to the understanding of lung stem cells is the use of cytotoxic agents. So we know that inhalation of particular agents such as naphthalene, which is that horrible smell in mothballs um, that you put in, in your wardrobes, or the use of bleomycin can selectively wipe out particular epithelial cell types within the lung. So by administering naphthalene or bleomycin to mice, you can actually then trace the epithelial damage and the cells that respond to the injury that's been produced and what you can identify what cells start to proliferate and reconstitute the epithelium of the lung. So from a combination of these assays, about five, six years ago, eight years ago, it was thought that there were really sort of five different populations of stem cells in the lung. So we're not talking about there's one stem cell for all of the lung. It was really thought that there were five or there was a spatial distribution and a regional location of particular stem cell populations at different regions within the lung, going from the proximal lung, which is the trachea and the upper airways, to the distal lung, which includes the bronchioles and the alveolar bed. And so these included um, the... Uh, basal cells of the submucosal gland within the trachea. Another population of basal cells in the intercartilaginous zones within the um, upper bronchi. Um, these club cells, so they're called Clara cells here, that, they're now called club cells. That was a change because they were named after a scientist called Clara who was implicated in... Um, untoward testing on human individuals in World War II, and so they, their name was removed from the nomenclature of the naming of cells, so they're called club cells. So club cells in the um, uh, neuroepithelial bodies, which are nerve clusterings within the lung. Then there are also these variant Clara cells, which seem to locate at the bronchialveolar duct junctions as well, which is the... Um, sort of the in interface or the intersection between the bronchi and the alveolar unit. And then it was also known that there were these alveolar progenitor cells, which were type 2 pneumocytes. So type 2 pneumocytes uh, in the alveolar pro al alveoli um, produce surfactant. And when there was damage to the alveoli, these AT2 cells could produce AT1 cells, which are the gas exchange cells. So it's actually been... From this increase in sophistication of technology, coupled with interest in this area, that a lot of um, stem cell scientists have actually elucidated um, and had a look at the comparison between these um, progenitor cell populations. And it was found that there were different techniques being used to not only identify but to isolate and track these different populations. So, by having a look at when using particularly flow cytometry and um, in vitro clonogenic assays, we actually now start to think that in the upper airway, so in the trachea and bronchi, there are these basal cells in the submucosal gland um, and also in these intercartilaginous zones. There's some cartilage there. 
But in the more distal airway, so in the bronchioles and alveoli, that it's thought that there's actually a common epithelial progenitor cell. And this, common, this epithelial progenitor cell is actually what's giving rise to alveolar progenitor cells, so the AT2 cells, but also these um, bronchiolar progenitors as well that can produce um, both ciliated and secretory um, epithelial cells. And that these cells cluster in different spatial locations, but they are derived from a common um, progenitor cell. So that's sort of the lay of the land at the moment. We think that there's less diversity than had been thought eight years ago, but there are discrete subpopulations. And this is a subject of ongoing um, interest and research as well. So when we think of respiratory diseases, you've heard about asthma from Christine and you've heard about COPD from Gary Anderson. And if we start to think about using stem cells as a way of being able to treat lung disease, we need to recognise really the highly diverse pathophysiology of the different, different lung um, diseases. And these can be caused by a variety of factors, or they can manifest as a variety of factors, including changes to the microenvironment. We know that the microenvironment is essential for the regulation of stem cells, either because it can be permissive or restrictive, or it can um, induce those cells to behave in ways that are inappropriate for appropriate, inappropriate for correct repair. So it can be changes to the microenvironment, such as the extracellular matrix might be altered. We might have a huge amount of inflammation, or you can actually see cellular changes to the epithelium and cellular changes to the mesenchyme. And one of the things that I didn't mention on the slide before when I was looking at the different stem cells in the lung is they're just epithelial stem cells. We also know, and the focus of my research for many years was looking at mesenchymal progenitor cells in the lung, because we know that in order to grow epithelial stem cells in a dish, they have to have contact um, and be provided with soluble factors from the mesenchyme or from mesenchymal progenitors. And so these interactions between these two cell types can become dysregulated. So for example, if we're thinking about, uh, if we do a comparison between, let's say, pulmonary fibrosis, you have an increase in fibrous tissue, an increase in mesenchymally derived um, fibrosis. Then we compare that to emphysema at late stage where you actually have a loss of mesenchyme. You have a loss of connective tissue, a loss of that supportive tissue. So very different approaches are required um, in order to treat these different diseases. So it's not straightforward. And we know that just as well as there being huge diversity in the pathophysiology, there is an enormous diversity of cells in the lung. So there are between 40 and 60 different cell types within the lung. So if you're thinking about having to reconstitute a section of tissue, then it's going to be very difficult. There's this complex architecture or topology. The, the structure, the shape is complicated. You have multiple 13 plus different branching um, events that occur in the bronchi, all the way down to the, to the terminal alveoli. So you've got a complex architecture there with multiple different cell types as well. So you've got smooth muscle cells, you've got epithelium, you've got um, uh, fibrous cells, or, um, and then you've got nerves as well. And you may also be required to manipulate the microenvironment. That might need to be, um, to be modified. And we still have a paucity or a lack of ways to be able to identify stem cells to be able to use them. It's becoming a lot better and more clear and clarified, but we've still got a way to go to do that. So there are a few different approaches. We can use regenerative medicine, so the application of stem cells as a cellular therapy. We can look to regulate the endogenous stem cells, so give them the guide or the guides or cues to be able to respond in an appropriate way. And this is somewhat coupled to immunomodulation. Bioengineering, so creating a new tissue from scratch using engineering approaches. Christine's just talked about the uh, possibility of uh, manipulating the genome in order to um, change uh, the genetic makeup that causes diseases, for example, for cystic fibrosis. And then there's this approach of modulating the immune environment 
or an inflammatory environment by the use of mesenchymal stromal cells. So I showed you a similar decision tree um, in my wrap-up lecture for the stem cell tissue engineering block, and I'm not going to go through this, but really that there are multiple considerations that need to be made in the severity of the disease, the, what type of tissue is required and how much of it. And that's going to dictate the direction of what type of cells you use, what type of scaffold you use, the approach. So I mentioned decellularization in my lecture and that's been of keen interest in lung stem cell researchers. So decellularization is a process of taking um, an intact piece of tissue or a whole organ and then by subjecting that to a range of mechanical and enzymatic um, processes you actually remove all of the cellular components of that organ leaving just the uh, three-dimensional topology and structure of that um, tissue with all the extracellular matrix and the idea was that then you could use this as a scaffold without having to 3D print it or to um, generate your own scaffold as a way of being able to recellularize um, this decellularized organ you can culture it in a bioreactor, allow the cells to adhere and to reconstitute the, um, the tissue and then that can be transplanted back into individuals and it can be through a range of processes. So you could use your IPS cells for example to generate multiple different cell lineages to reconstitute the cellular portion or the, or the, and the parenchyma. So that's been looked at in animal models. Um, so in 2010 there was a paper published um, which actually decellularized a rat lung and then they reconstituted cells uh, within the decellularized construct and then transplanted that back into a rat. It lasted a few hours um, but eventually the organ failed because of um, thrombosis or clotting because of um, an intact endothelium within blood vessels. Then in 2012, we've actually seen a, uh, in an animal model, so this is in a sheep model using lambs, um, a group in Boston took a um, 3D printed um, trachea, uh, sorry, a, a um, decellularized trachea and they reconstituted that trachea with mesenchymal stromal cells and then they transplanted that back into some resected trachea and that was successful in reconstituting um, that uh, trachea. And there was actually a published study in 2008 where um, a clinician and researcher um, actually used a similar technique in humans. It was later found that this individual was completely fraudulent, that none of this was actually tested. He did actually perform these surgeries. Six out of the eight individuals died through this process. Um, and it, he had never performed any um, trials in animal models before he did this in patients. So that was quite scandalous and they, the results were falsified and it caused quite a lot of damage to individuals. So um, I will talk a little bit now about um, immunomodulation in the last few minutes. So we know that and it's well established that uh, MSCs, mesenchymal stromal cells, produce uh, immuno immunomodulatory agents. So originally it was thought when MSCs were discovered that these cells could actually be used to transplant into tissue and they would directly engraft into the tissue and repair it themselves. And what we found was that these cells didn't engraft in these transplanted um, constructs. What we found though was that they supported the endogenous repair of that tissue. And over the years it's been elucidated that uh, mesenchymal stromal cells um, actually produce a range of trophic, event, uh, trophic agents. So they have um, both immunomodulatory effects um, and they also have antimicrobial effects and they also um, promote cell survival, recruitment and repair. They're also immune privileged so they don't elicit an immune response. So you can use allogeneic cells, so cells from another individual as well. So let's have a look at a clinical trial that's been in process. So prochymal um, is a mesenchymal stromal product that's been developed by Osiris Therapeutics. They've just been bought out by Mesoblast. These are 
Allogeneic mesenchymal stromal cells derived from the bone marrow. In 2013, they published in CHEST um, about their application of these cells in individuals with COPD. They gave um, these COPD patients infusions of these cells uh, every four months for two years. And what they did was they tra traced a whole range of parameters, including their respiratory parameters. So looked at, looking at their FEV1 and their FVC and the ratio of those. And what they found was that um, although these cells were well tolerated, they didn't cause a rep any repair. So they didn't improve lung function in these individuals. And you might have a think of Gary Anderson's lecture as to why that might be the case in individuals with diagnosed COPD. So um, prochymal uh, is being used in multiple other clinical trials for grass versus host disease. They're in phase three trials. It's being used for Crohn's disease and they're about to go into phase two trials for diabetes as well. So at the moment, safe, but we don't know how effective it is especially not in lung. So Cimeris uh, is a, a modification on a similar theme. So this is Sonata Therapeutics that I mentioned, who have their head office in Melbourne. And they've generated MSCs, but from um, mesenchymoangioblast precursor cells, which have been derived from iPS cells. So these are MSCs derived from iPS. And they say that there's less batch variability, can generate more cells using this method. So it's um, going to be of, uh, of more benefit, more applicable. And they've actually done some preclinical studies. They're only just going into phase one clinical trials with this product now. Um, and in their preclinical trials have been quite convincing for graft versus host disease. And they've also looked at the use of these cells in asthma. They, what they did was they um, induced asthma in mice. How am I going? A few minutes. They induced asthma in mice by exposing them to, the, them to ovalbumin. And by doing that, they show, these mice show um, airway hypersensitivity. So if you give them methylcholine, which you heard is used um, as a bronco challenge or a bronchoconstriction challenge clinically, when they expose them to methylcholine, their airways are hyper-responsive and they get bronchoconstriction. So what they did was they, so in this mouse model, they exposed them to ovalbumin, and then they administered these uh, MSCs from iPS cells either intravenously or intranasally. And what they found was, and I know it's a very clustered graph, I'm hoping when you do your graphical um, assignment you won't have a clustered gra uh, cluttered graph like this, um, that they actually found that with administration of these MSCs intranasally particularly, they actually saw a reduction in airway uh, hyper uh, sensitivity, hyper responsiveness as well. So if you have a look on clinicaltrials.gov, which is the NIH uh, site for listing for clinical trials, you'll find that there are currently 68 clinical trials listed using lung and mesenchymal. And they're being used, there are 35 that are active and they're being used for a range of lung diseases, which are listed here. So, of course, the promise of stem cells has generated a lot of hope for individuals who have severe asthma or COPD. And, of course, that goes hand in hand with um, disreputable agents offering stem cell therapy, unproven stem cell therapies to individuals, which is what Megan talked about in her lecture. So recently, a team of very highly regarded clinicians and um, lung, lung researchers came out with this statement, um, which was really a call to action for those involved in both respiratory and critical care communities to speak out against this international boom in stem cell tourism for um, unproven therapies for respiratory diseases. So if you're interested, have a look at this paper. The American Thoracic Society also formed the Assembly on Respiratory Cell and Molecular Biology Stem Cell Working Group produced. So this working group consisted of clinicians, scientists and patient advocacy, uh, advocacy groups. And they actually uh, published this statement on stem cell tourism as well and provided a resource for individuals to be able to go to to find reputable uh, resources. So in summary, I hope you recognise the lung is complex, 
It's highly regulated. There are diverse pathophysiologies, and it's very complex to deliver stem cells as a biological therapy. I'm hoping also that you'll be able to identify different approaches that can be used and the considerations that are required. Finally, I'd just like to draw your attention to on, on Tuesday's lecture, there is no physical lecturer who's going to be here. Mike McDonough is an addiction specialist. He's actually been offered a role in South Australia and has moved there, but he's recorded his two lectures for you. So I'm going to provide that on LMS, but I'm also going to screen it in the lecture theatre if you have your routine of coming to the lecture every Tuesday. So we'll actually show that, we'll have a viewing um, if you wish to watch it in, uh, in situ. All right, thanks everyone. I hope you went well yesterday. We'll see you next week. way the question read for just the graph one. It sounds like they want one or you want one graph type. It says explain your the question shows explain your choice of graph, not graphs. Oh it can be graphs. It can be graphs? Yeah, okay yeah, good. Yeah, right. yeah. And my next question is the because of the punctuation it sounds like you only want two graphs to be made in total. Is that right? Is that one graph for heart rate and then one graph for um, both you systolic could, and diastolic, you or would you like? You could probably put them all on one if you wanted to, but it might be faster. Yep, so um, like, would you just say split them all off and kind of make it easy? I, I'm trying to not tell you. <laughs> I'd like you to make that decision, but um, I certainly wouldn't be making... Just don't be limited, you mean. Just make it easy. Make it easy, but make sure that what you're plotting on the graph allows the reader to be able to do a direct comparison. Sure. Okay. Okay. Yep. So it might not be very helpful to look at to compare heart rate and blood pressure on the same graph. That might be excessive. But you might want to think about you might want to consider whether you put systolic and diastolic on the same graph because you might want to compare those because we know there's pulse pressure, for example. Um, and you want to be able to compare between your control and your treated groups cool. as well. Yep. Okay. Thank Sorry, you. it's yeah, hard to. Yeah, no, fair. Um, I was just going to ask, what's been the consensus of the test yesterday? I haven't heard any feedback on the test. Yeah, um, like, I mean, I've done that a bit, but, like, I've just gone all the way through, and I just thought I've never completed that test once in my life, but I thought it was, I thought it was really unfair. I thought the amount of content, the amount of, I mean, we left all the content in the question. I just don't want to be, like, in a sense, punished because some no, people no, weren't no, at no, once. No, okay. Yeah. Um, I understand that. We always have equity, absolutely, yeah. first in our minds in those kind of situations. But we have a lot of people in Australia who, who sat were quite severely disadvantaged. Yeah. Because, and performed better in school. We work out a way to make that. Because I've literally not, I mean, I've had hard tests, I've had tests that I haven't mm -hmm. finished, but I don't feel like I've been sort of felt unfair, made unfair by a test okay. like that before. Yeah. Okay. And, I've, and I wouldn't complain if I didn't feel as if that but was... But unfair because you didn't have enough time to complete. Not that it wasn't enough time. Like, I mean, I've, there's been tests where I literally I haven't had enough time and like that I've been close to finishing, but I feel like that this required a lot more. It, the questions that were 
abhängt ein bisschen 